Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Many of us learned about the Proud Boys after the infamous presidential debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, in which Trump ordered them to stand back and stand by. More recently, the Proud Boys are showing up at libraries to protest Drag Queen Story Hour on the Joe Rogan podcast or in frequent segments on Fox News. But the Proud Boys are not just a one-off affiliation of right-winged, middle-aged MAGA guys that like to crash progressive rallies and irritate the libs. It is an uncomfortable truth that our history is replete with similar movements where media figures and politicians promoted fascism, hatred of immigrants and minority groups, and the worship of strong men leaders. And our guest today is an expert on the subject, so let's discuss. Well, warm greetings. Boy, are we looking forward to this. Hello, Andy Campbell. Welcome to our podcast. So good to be here, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. And Andy, you are uh, uh, a, a senior editor at Huffington Post. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. well, yep, I've been there for uh, 11 years now. Still going strong. Well, I don't know if this will make you feel good or not, but uh, when I when I wake up in the morning, I, I go through my email, and then I have a whole list of blogs, and my very first one is Huffington Post, and that's the honest to God truth. And then I oh, I, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. We, we we've employed a lot of really good reporters over the years, uh, so so it's it's great to hear we've got some dedicated readership. Good, good, and we're here to uh, talk about. Your book, as a part of the uh, being an editor for Huffington Post, mm -hmm. you're on the extremist beat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is, is that that might I don't know extremism, misinformation, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, and, and you know it's it it sort of evolved from you know I was a I was a, a crime reporter for a long time, and and that started me out as a essentially a mass shooting reporter in the 2015 oh, era man. era, uh, you know hurricanes and mass shootings, and 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 now. You know, as we saw violence um, erupting during Trump's first run, uh, that evolved into an extremism beat uh, over time. Well, you know, G Greg and I have the uh, best job in the world because we we started this podcast because we enjoy uh, reading books and we would ship them back and forth. And now we've had the luck of reading a book and being able to talk to the author. And we came uh, across your book from uh, the American Midnight uh, at the Historium that uh, was uh, wrote a wonderful review of your book. Immediately, I picked it up, uh, sent a copy to Greg, and that is this book here, A Proud Boys, We Are Proud Boys, How the Right-Wing Street Gangs Ushered in a New Era of American Extremism. And... Um, the book's been getting great press. Got a great review and Rolling Stone. Yeah, and you, you know, I first of all, I really appreciate the read and, and the the timing. You know, uh, couldn't have been better. I, you know, I've been reporting on these guys since they started in, uh, you know, six almost six years ago now. And when January six happened, I realized I need to put this down in a book. Um, I have some unique expertise in this era area and headed you know through this most recent election and headed into their seditious conspiracy trial in December um it, it's certainly good timing it just came out in, in September so um it is it is getting a lot of uh of of reads and I and I really appreciate that and I'm I'm glad I can help people sort of parse this extremism crisis as we head into uh this trial and the elections well, you definitely make the link that this is not just a bunch of uh, beer drinking buddies that kind of occasionally get out of control and have bar fights, and uh, and and it, you know, or um, they are a real phenomenon that's shaping our politics. And I guess once birthed, even though some of the leaders are in jail. There's. Do you see any feeling that this is being stifled at all, or they're they're still? Yeah, going? I mean, so you know, they they are still going, and 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 you make a really good point. So just to get in a little bit into the background here, you know, they they 
started as ostensibly uh, what, you know, Gavin McGinnis, their founder, called a, a you know, a fraternal drinking organization um, that, you know, is a, is a little political, but they get into fights from time to time. That's not true if you watch his show. His show, um, where he built the Proud Boys live uh, on his uh, reactionary online talk show, is, you know, he was peppering this this audience of angry men um, with with bigoted tenants um, and with calls to commit violence against the GOP's opponents. And that can change day to day. You know, back in 2020, it was BLM. Sometimes it's Antifa or leftists in general. Um, and right now, uh, through this summer and, and going forward, it's been um, LGBTQ, uh, you know, who the right is is characterizing broadly as groomers. Um, and so they they sort of latch on to GOP grievances. But but following January 6th, uh, when their leaders all, you know, many of their leaders are facing seditious conspiracy charges right now, they're going to have a trial uh, here in a few days. And uh, despite that, they are working as planned. The Proud Boys chapters, which are across the country, are mobilizing on the grievances of Trump and Tucker Carlson and whatever the right thinks is, is the bad thing of the day. They are going out in the street and putting violence to that. And, and that hasn't slowed down. Um, they, they are working, you know, autonomous, autonomously without uh, need for the, the leadership because the leadership taught them so well, look, you're out there to put that violent edge. You're out there to go out and, and fight where crusty old GOP guys aren't going to go out there. You guys are going to be the ones to go out there and, and uh, violently try to silence the GOP's opponents. And that's exactly what they're doing. And, uh, you know, even, even more than that, their, you know, playbook that they've created um, you know, showing that you can get away with political violence as a justified option in politics right now, that's not going away, even if the Proud Boys dissolved, which, by the way, I don't think is going to happen. But right. you are right to hit, you know, right off the bat here on the note that our extremism crisis has not been thwarted by hundreds of prosecutions in January 6th. Um, it, you know, it's only getting stronger. Um, and, 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 you know, you're seeing Trump go to dinner this last week with some prominent extremists uh, and, and it's uh, it's not getting tamped down because of the investigations. You know, right before we, we had um, a salon reporter on was talking about school extremism with schools and, and the uh, Hillsdale and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And as I was getting uh, ready for the podcast, uh, I was having a dinner party with a group of friends and a, a friend was interrupted and he said, our, our reservations at Point Townsend are being canceled because the Proud Boys were coming in to protest, I don't know, maybe reading cross-dressing story hour at the library or something. It right. was something nebulous. And But anyway, the whole city of Port Townsend shut down and all the reservations were canceled because they were so fearful of this group of people coming, all with their long rifles, all with their you know intention to disrupt. Yep. And, and uh, so and you know, you're, you're, I mean, you, you, that's exactly what's, what's happening right now. And, you know, w whether it's Boston children's hospital, which is, which has a, uh, uh, you know, trans healthcare system there, the proud boys and their allies were out there protesting and adding violence there, whether it's drag queen story hours across the country all summer, you know, Tucker Carlson on Fox news is complaining about drag queens and store drag queen story hours calling them groomers and the proud boys show up uh at, at places across the country with their allies um uh, to intimidate and harass in nevada uh this summer there was a drag queen story hour a proud boy showed up with a rifle and sent parents and children fleeing uh thinking they were about to to have a mass shooting situation um and and, and again that they're being joined by not only neo-Nazis and other extremists in the street uh, based on these GOP grievances, but everyday Americans uh, who believe that the Proud Boys are this necessary, you know, patriotic political force. And that's the scary part. It's not that, you know, you as a regular American have to worry that the Proud Boys are going to show up on your doorstep, although they have been known to make house calls. It's that 
they have so normalized political violence that that this political violence is spilling out of regular you know, MAGA rallies where we saw it in, in 2016 to 2020. And now that political violence is coming to everyday American life, children's hospitals, abortion rallies, uh, you know, anywhere where the the GOP complaint system is is realized is you're going to find guys in makeshift body armor and 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 you know, you, you said that there was an event that was canceled. That is their goal. They, you know, they want to scare and harass. Uh, and, and, and that seems like a success for them. 30, I'd like to ask Andy, Andy a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to give some perspective to this. Uh, I, I looked around on Wikipedia and other places. I didn't take a deep dive. But what, what are your estimations of the numbers? I think that's an important factor in terms mm -hmm. of a perspective. And you've studied this. So you're you're certainly uh, uh, one of the best sources we could have for sure. some perspective on the numbers. Number one and number two, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in follow the money. So maybe you could give us some idea of what kind of financial sources or, or forces are behind them. I mean, they've managed to survive. They're managed to flourish. Mm -hmm. And when you see that, you have to ask yourself, what? Where's the source? Where's the money come from? Where's the right. where's the uh, foundation for this? Two very good questions, and, and we'll start with the numbers. So their numbers are in the thousands, uh, and and that changes from day to day. The thing is, is it's not very difficult to join the Proud Boys, and it's not very difficult to say that you've never been involved. And so it's it's hard to pin down direct numbers, especially because originally they built all of their followings across the nation on Facebook, which has deplatformed them. So we don't have like roles right but um they do have they boast and whether this is true or not they boast uh 150 chapters across the country some of those might have two people some of them might have several hundred um they but they definitely have th they're in the thousands um but but what i argue always is that their threat is not necessarily in their numbers although they do um mobilize in the hundreds and sometimes thousands to big events wherever the national organization tells them to go. But their their coalition building is so strong that they are able to sort of, you know, put together, hey, this, this groomer event is happening at a public library in Nevada, calling all, you know, calling everyone. Uh, and, and, and they will bring together all sorts of elements. It's why they had, you know, they helped bring people, equipment, and money to the insurrection. And a lot of people forget that a proud boy uh, was the organizer of uh, Unite the Right in Charlottesville proud in 2017. Boy. And and while the Proud Boys were told not to show their colors at Unite the Right, look how many people showed up there to, to ally with them. And so their numbers specifically are less important than their ability to to call everyone to arms with them and and you know their relationships within the GOP are such that they are you know they are embraced by an entire political party and so you don't you know if if a, if a neo nazi puts together a rally you might see some conservatives saying hey we we're not involved in that don't go out there but if a proud boy does I mean, a good swath of the GOP uh, is not only friends with them, but, you know, fully supports what they're doing out in the street, that they're fighting some, uh, you know, patriotic fight for the GOP. And so people rally be, rally around that. And and, uh, and and so it's really their coalition building that 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 draws concern in terms of numbers. In would terms of money. The, would, you call, would you call them the uh, mil, uh, the uh, Minutemen of the movement, of, of the, kind of like the <laughs> that particular. You know, it's uh, that, that's right. interesting. I mean, they, you know, the, the 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 they are allied with the Oath Keepers, who call you know, essentially directly uh, describe themselves as the militia, right? Um, the Trump's militia. Um, you know, the Proud Boys are half um, militia. They want to go out and fight. Um, fight for for Trump causes, but they also are a political monster. I mean, uh, just today, I learned that uh, there was a, a proud boy elected as vice chair of the Clackamas County Republican Party in Oregon. Um, and he's been involved, you know, he believes that that uh, that LGBTQ should be uh, uh, 
taken from schools. He's been in fights for the Proud Boys. These guys, their leadership told me for my book that they want to uh, pick up offices big and small so that they can affect local politics. And so they they have this this political mindset. I if you if you liken them to another group um, beyond like the brown shirts, uh, I would liken them more to the KKK. I mean, these guys are they've got, you know, political savvy. They have people in the upper echelon of politics and they want to build small circles uh, in different um, locales, not only to change local politics, but to change local mindsets about what they are. Um, and so they're very propaganda based. They're very um, um, locally based and they want to have little pockets of Proud Boys to respond in any area where they see fit. Now, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, well, <laughs> about the KKK too, uh, one thing to remember is that uh, the, the, you know, the KKK didn't lose all the power it lost in, you know, the late twenties because the nation rebuffed them. It's because enough of the nation sort of agreed with that ideology that they weren't needed as a political force anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's the concern that I have going forward with this kind of politically violent and bigoted ideology that the Proud Boys profess is that I, I'm worried that they're becoming so normalized and their, their playbook of committing violence at political rallies is so normalized that they're just not going to be really needed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we need a full culture shift here to reject what the Proud Boys are doing. Um, but to, to, to answer your question about where's the money coming from, it is a you know super interesting story. Initially, um, you know they were getting a lot of their money from online crowdsourcing, where you know Enrique Tario, uh, their chairman, was was arrested, and they raised four hundred thousand dollars within days on GoFundMe, uh, the, uh, or Give, Send, Go. I believe it was Give, Send, Go, sorry. Um, but one of the crowdfunding platforms. And, you know, until they were recently deplatformed from a lot of those platforms, they were making hundreds of thousands of dollars based on what we learned is, is really just everyday American people. Right. Um, so far, uh, you know, super concerning because I was assuming going into this, you know, that, that there was some shadow donor, a Peter Thiel type who was giving them a whole bunch of money. Um, but so far, we haven't found that. And in fact, we found the opposite is true, that because of the way that they've normalized what they're doing, a lot of Americans, you know, just regular everyday Americans will donate five, 10 bucks to these guys and say, hey, thanks for being out there and fighting for us. And, and, and that's really concerning. Now, there are a lot of questions remaining on 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 where their money's coming from now that they've sort of been deplatformed because certainly their ability to send their guys from Seattle, their guys from New York to the middle of the country on a day's notice and get them all hotels and planes uh is remains despite um their deplatforming from these these providers um and we don't know. I'm hoping that during discovery during their sedition trials we'll learn a little bit more about where they're making their money, whether they're shadow donors, whether they're doing some illicit selling, or whether it's really just coming from merch that they sell, which they do make a substantial amount off of. I I have a question, but I'm going to start the question with a, you know, um, a statement first, and then a but, and then my question. And the, and the statement is, is that um, I have so many family members in law enforcement. My sister mm -hmm. is a police chief, brother-in-law's assistant chief, and I have a couple young nephews that are police officers. So one that works uh, the um, Portland Portland situation nightly when the Antifa and Proud Boys were there. So mm -hmm. I I am I am totally pro. Uh, have my sympathies with the police and how they're trying to respond to all of this, especially in the sure. new era of defunding the police. Here's the but. The but is what the heck is this kind of relationship with the police kind of tacitly um, standing by the fist bumps in Brooklyn, the um, uh, uh, allowing the violence to occur with some of the Black Lives protesters that has been well documented? Is it just portions of the police department that is then being amplified through social media 
or right? Well, is, it, or is it a little more nebulous? Yeah, it's it, it's super nebulous, and and you know, and I appreciate you saying your family because I have family in 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 military and and in law enforcement. I have a, a family member with the Washington State Patrol, so they probably know your family members. But but uh, and so I you know I have this thought too. I mean, certainly uh, these there there is no blanket term uh, for how you can describe any department or any officer, but um, there are these sort of nuanced relationships that happen. And it goes back to, um, you know, what I was saying about this normalization. I mean, the Proud Boys, you know, I've been reporting on them for six years since they first started. And and since the beginning, they have had pro-police messaging as part of their propaganda because their mm. end goal, it, you know, the, the highest degree or rank of the Proud Boy is achieved only by committing political violence for GOP causes. That is the rule. So uh, committing political violence is, is a rule uh, for the Proud Boys. And to do that unimpeded by uh, police, they have very effectively integrated police, pro-police messaging um, so that when you know, uh, you know, I'm uh, a reporter standing in Portland, Oregon, where there's a, a Proud Boys rally, the Proud Boys having committed years of political violence there. Um, and you have the Proud Boys on one side, you have counter protesters on the other side, which may include anti-fascists in black, or it may include locals in Portland, Oregon. Um, and then there's a line of police between them. Uh, and you have this, the Proud Boys side, holding up blue lives matter flags back the blue uh and you know and then you have a you know the other side which may or may not be shouting f the police uh who do you think that the police are going to stand right. with their backs to well always always i've seen it's been the proud boys even though um 99.9% of the time if not 100% of the time uh, the proud boys are the aggressors and they utilize those events to try and goad people into fighting them which is what they want to do so that they can get their highest rank um so there's this this sort of general messaging that creates an inherent sort of uh comfortableness between uh police and proud boys but also it's not illegal to be a proud boy and again, like I said, half, you know, a swath of the country believes that they are a patriotic force. And so uh, another thing that you have to think about is that there's, you know, police who are members of the Proud Boys. There was two uh, officers who were also Proud Boys who were on the insurrectionist side of the insurrection. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are uh, police departments often have zero idea what to do. Uh, when they find out one of their own is a member of an extremist group because they say, well, it's not illegal. It's a free speech issue. Now, I would argue personally uh, that it is a it is a bias issue. You know, if if you have uh, your police officer, if you're a chief and you have a police officer who is a part of a group that believes that certain people aren't fully human and uh, wants to commit political violence as a rule, uh, I feel like they're your, you know, your jurisdiction isn't going to feel very safe when they have that officer uh, uh, trying to serve and protect them, right? Um, so I believe it's a it's a bias issue and a, and a safety issue, but but jurisdictions across the country treat this very differently, um, and so so there is, you know, the sort of this inherent relationship. We found a lot of officers that are members of the Proud Boys, and uh, and it and, and it creates this. Uh, situation where, um, you know, departments are sort of inherently on the side of the right wing extremists because they're holding up those flags. Uh, and, 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 it, and, and then after, you know, the dust settles and police are fighting protesters and arresting proud boys and yeah, the, the community uh, loses this trust factor. So it just, it creates this downward spiral. Um, Last thing I'll say on that is, is that I spoke to, at length, I spoke to uh, Michael Fanon, who was a, a former uh, uh, Capitol Police officer who was attacked at the insurrection uh, about this issue. And he was telling me, you know, uh, there, there needs to be, uh, but will probably never be, a national 
rubric for um, police training um, and 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 also a, a vetting process and a an auditing process to find extremist elements um, within police departments because one police department uh, in one jurisdiction may be full of veteran police officers who know their way around a, a, a firearm and aren't going to be so scared during a situation that they start firing off shots. And another jurisdiction may be volunteers from the local community who have uh, never shot a gun in their life and and may not know what to do in hostile environments. And there's just no national vetting process. Uh, and, and it'll be hard to get there because, of course, you know, a lot of state jurisdictions see federal oversight on that matter as as uh, authoritarianism. Right. So it's tough. It's really tough. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I totally agree with you that it's it's it, it's a hard conversation because you start talking about these things and people start saying, well, you're anti-police um, just for bringing it up. It's almost like the gun issue in, in, in that sense. And so it's it's, it's difficult for sure. <laughs> How about anti-FBI? I mean, at the trial, you have the six informants that were six FBI informants. I I have a feeling, it's my prediction, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right 50% of the time, so I'm as good as any pundit. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're wrapping up the January 6th issue, and there was some mm -hmm. rumblings that a lot of the ancillary topics associated with there's going to be pushed under the you know, pushed under the rug. And one of which is the role of the FBI, the role of right. the Secret Service with their obvious uh, scrubbing of their phones. The, um, you know, the fact, I don't know, I mean, I'm sounding like I'm a, you know, right wing nut, but sort of the deep state that is kind of protecting its, uh, protecting its its elements. You um, know, I don't know. What, what's your thought about that? Am I, am well, I you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, 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 to go, just go back, the, the Proud Boys defense for the sedition trial alleges that there were something like eight FBI agents who had infiltrated the Proud Boys leading up to January 6th. And if that turns out to be true, it raises huge questions about what the FBI knew before January 6th, when, because I know from reporting that the Proud Boys started gearing up for January 6th as civil war uh, immediately after trump uh you know in in uh no you know in 2020 said stand back stand by on that debate stage and so certainly there was you know if there were eight fbi agents within the proud boys at that time they must have seen so much of what is the alleged planning that they did going into that and so there will be huge questions about what uh you know, what they knew, when they knew it, and why they didn't report it, and why we didn't stop this from happening. Same goes with the Secret Service issue you were talking about. And so there is, you know, new, there are new national conversations going on right now about, you know, what actual role our law enforcement plays in uh, domestic extremism. And, and law enforcement is only now just showing itself to, to be starting to catch up with this issue. An outgoing DHS spokesperson after January 6th said, hey, we thought the Proud Boys were just a drinking club, a fraternal drinking club. And it's like, that is exactly how they want to be seen. And so if you right. really think that when me and a number of other extremism reporters have been screaming this from the hilltops since 2017, uh, it, you know, we have some catch up to do. There, there are so many questions. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really excited, uh, just interested to learn what we gain from this sedition trial i think it's going to uh, unearth a lot of uh, uh scabs for sure yeah andy uh you, you brought up the uh the the, the dinner party at mar-a-lago last week mm -hmm. and i'm sure lots of people would like to know more about nick fuentes and uh is that your beat can you tell us more about uh, nick fuentes who is this guy? yeah absolutely in the ultra right <clears throat> so so he is a he is a uh, white nationalist uh, very rabidly bigoted um, podcaster who's been around, uh, you know, about the same amount of time as the Proud Boys have. And he, like Milo Yiannopoulos, um, who has been sort of hanging around Kanye West in that circle as well, um, 
you know, they were so rapidly bigoted. Um, you know, Fuentes is a Holocaust denier who likens himself proudly to Hitler. Um, like that's it's that kind of sort of Nazi rhetoric. Um, they were so rapidly bigoted that even their own circles of really far right, really radical guys had sort of pushed them away. And that was, you know, from the work of illuminating what they were saying for years um, from journalists, activists and researchers just showing, look how terrible these guys are. They are they have such huge followings online. Uh, look at the terrible things they're saying and look at the GOP elements that are embracing them. And so they kind of got pushed by the wayside, even in their own circles. They didn't go away completely, but people didn't really listen to them. And now, you know, Nick Fuentes and Milo Yiannopoulos, who is a similarly bigoted shock jock kind of guy who uh, uh, defended pedophilia at one point, he's, you know, uh, just horribly racist and and, and anti-LGBTQ. But, but these guys over the last week, just through their connections to Kanye West and Kanye West's connection to Trump have gone from that, you know, that years of work that went into deplatforming them and pushing them to the outskirts of the conversation. All of that got erased over the last week. They meet with the president, they gain his huge platform, and, and, and now they're back in the conversation. And you can bet that these guys are going to show up on more and more, uh, uh, you know, standardized mass media. I wouldn't be surprised if Nick Fuentes went on Fox News soon. Um, and that's actually a really scary prospect because Fox News has such a huge following. It's the number one news network. Um, and, 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 you know, this is exactly uh, the way that the Proud Boys work. I mean, these guys, Milo and Nick Fuentes, have both been, you know, in the same orbit as the Proud Boys, and the Proud Boys have been in the orbit of Trump's people. They've been in orbit with Roger Stone. And so all of these things create this web of extremism. But Fuentes, the Proud Boys, Milo, they are only as powerful as the platform they're given. The Proud Boys have built themselves a platform that makes a lot of the country think that they're patriotic. And if Nick Fuentes you know, gains this platform despite the anti-Semitism and the racism and the bigotry. Um, uh, if, if he's given Trump's platform repeatedly, that's just going to be normal. Um, and and it, uh, if the opposite happens, if the country decides, hey, we don't want extremist gangs running the streets causing violence. We don't want people like Nick Fuentes on our news network spouting, uh, you know, anti-Jewish sentiment. Um, those elements would go away. Uh, but, but but right now, the really big concern of that meeting with Trump is, is the platforming of this ideology, the giving it millions of viewers. Because even if you, you know, if, if, you, if you have a show or a political platform that includes an audience of millions and you bring on a Nazi and you debate that Nazi and you push back against the Nazi on your on your program or your political platform, even bringing him on is still gifting him that audience. And, 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 and that's what we call platforming, right? And so the concerning thing is that even if, even if Nick Fuentes shows up again in mass media and gets, you know, batted down and told he's racist and bad, there is still a swath of that millions of Americans who are going to go, I agree with what he said. And, and that's how this ideology gets normalized. So it's 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 very, very concerning. Um, even, even though I think a lot of the country thinks that this guy is ridiculous, it doesn't take many more people to, to agree with him to create an extremism crisis. And that's what we have. Rachel Maddow had a segment last night on her show where she played a little couple minute clip of, you know, the greatest hits of his, um, mm -hmm you know, the statements and expressions, I, my mouth dropped. I mean, I, I didn't realize how horrible um, a person he is. Right. And, and, you know, but you're, you're, you're being mainstreamed by, uh, in, let me, let me change the subject again. In preparation for this, I went back and looked at a lot of the clips. I read the Vice article that you mentioned where that was scrubbed from Vice, uh, but it was essentially date rape uh, instructions by McGinnis. 
Right. I listened to a lot of the Joe Rogan stuff with him. Mm-hmm. Joe Rogan and Tim Poole w- had this just bro discussion of this guy was just kind of joking. He's just he's just a fun guy. Why are you being so woke that you can't uh, mm-hmm. separate his kind of s- a satirical overview of the modern political economy? Oh my God! They're 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 elevating this guy right to a, a level that is giving them exposure, and that's a typical Joe Rogan thing I'm seeing him doing. It's just yes. like, hey, I just I just bring these guys on. I don't necessarily do, agree with them. I just give them a platform of millions and millions of views, right. and don't really push back. But you know, hey, don't blame me, <laughs> Pat. I wish everyone understood how this works like you do because. That I never get more hate mail than when I tweet about Joe Rogan in that very subject, um, because people come in and say, "Well, he brought on a terrible extremist, but he uh, he he argued with him. He told him he was bad, and the that's that's not the issue. The issue is is you have in Joe Rogan 11 million followers who are being you you are giving that platform to somebody who otherwise wouldn't have had any platform and and he brings on someone like Gavin McGinnis where you know he brought on Gavin McGinnis back in in 2017 and gave Gavin McGinnis and the Proud Boys their first huge platform upon which uh, Gavin recruited and made money um and got his start as an extremist leader and Joe Rogan on that very episode pushed back and said, hey, I don't agree with some of the things you're saying, but that doesn't matter. Gavin McGinnis would not have had that platform. And of course, you know, what does it lead to after they leave your program, a Tim Pool or a Joe Rogan type? It leads to Fox News getting in touch with those guys and saying, hey, you were on this mildly mainstream uh, uh, podcast. Uh, You must be okay to interview in the even more mainstream. And of course, the Fuentes types, the Proud Boys types, they love all of this because they are propagandists. They they want, they go, okay, if I'm talking to a million people and 900,000 of them think uh, that I'm an idiot, uh, that 100,000 may have learned something and, and, and seen a softer side of me. When you've got Tim Pool or Joe Rogan saying, ah, they're just joking or lightly pushing back, this is a platform. It's, 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 it's one of the uh, the biggest factors fueling our extremism crisis, and it is a behemoth of a machine. I mean, um, you know, Enrique Tario and the Proud Boys are working uh, every day to get anyone to talk to them. That's why they'll still talk to me, even though I wrote a book that was very, very, very critical of them. They would still talk to me. Enrique Tar- Tario talked to me for the book because they think that if they can get any quote in any sort of mass media, that is a bonus because it, you know, uh, it's it's ultimately a net positive for them. The people that didn't like them aren't going to like them anymore, and there may be a couple of people who do like them after that. It's a, you know, it, it's a media responsibility issue, and and it's, uh, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of catch up to do. Um, Joe Rogan being one of them, and uh, Sarah Silverman, and. Um... Cross and you know some of these other comedians that I think rightfully so take their edgy little uh, you know humor and I enjoy that I enjoy the you know when people kind of push the boundaries but they had this kind of relationship with him and elevated him and uh, you know oh he's just kind of an Andrew or Andrew Dice Clay kind of thing he's just kind of making fun they're not talking about that now. No. And, you know, you know, uh, that's a that's another thing you hit perfectly, because, uh, you know, in the early aughts, the the Gavin McGinnis's misogynist uh, brand of comedy was really popular. And he had a lot of popular friends. I was just at a bar the other weekend talking to somebody who had read my book. And he goes, wow, you know, I used to be friends with Gavin McGinnis and he was a normal guy. But but what happened in the early aughts is that the the culture moved on and evolved and decided, hey, this isn't what we think is funny anymore. And a number of people like Sarah Silverman, like David Cross, you know, sort of shedded themselves 
of this rhetoric and, and, and move forward and change to their comedy as we've done for generations and generations right. since Shakespeare, right? Uh, uh, and and a, a number of other people like Gavin McGinnis, like Fuentes, like all of these shock jocks said, hey, wait, there's a freaking huge audience for 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 this stuff still. And I'm going to latch onto that and keep that and double down. And so while you know a bunch of comedians evolved, you know, a bunch of comedians said, I am not only going to double down on this, but I'm going to create a self-victimization narrative. You know, it's why you have, you know, what Norm Macdonald is, it does this and uh, Dave Chappelle does this where they're on Fox News all the time. And they're saying, well, you know, it's illegal to be a comedian now. No, the country has evolved and we just don't think you're funny anymore. And, uh, you know, and your audience is comprised of people who violently believe uh, the things that you are saying, um, especially the misogynist anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. Um, so you, you're right that Gavin was friends with all sorts of very normal mainstream people, but as he got more radical, a lot of those people moved on. Um, and a, a number of those people you described didn't want to talk for my book, and I, I kind of understand why. They don't want to be held responsible for the things that he said, which are super abhorrent. Do you see this as something new or do you think this is just a repeat of history? What do you think, Greg? Well, I mean, I think you have to put it in a context. And the context is that there's an emerging uh, um, answer to the pro global problems. And unfortunately, it's not coming from the left because the left has been decimated in the, throughout the world. And so these right-wing populists are filling that space in. And while I think uh, these these movements that Andy's uh, identified, and we're we're lucky to have people out there identifying them to see just how ugly they are, they're marginal to that move to that larger picture in the sense that right wing populism is going to grow if we don't have a response from the left. If the, if we rely on the current center forces, the Democratic Party, for example, or the the Labour Party in, in 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 the UK, or the Social Democrats in Germany, or what's left of uh, the Democratic Party in Italy, we're we're just going to see the growth of this right wing populism because they are they're phonies, but they're addressing they're addressing the grievances of many many people. They're in a bogus right. way, just as Trump addressed these these bogus uh, in a bogus way. So, uh, in, in my perspective on it, is that we need. We need watchdogs like Andy telling us what's going on on the fringe of this. But the larger question is, is, is uh, uh, what's happening globally and in terms of mass politics. The movements and, of the past, like the, KK, the KKK in the 20s, the Black Legions in the 30s, anti-labor, became mass movements. And, and my fear is that some of these things that Andy has outlined can turn into these mass movements. And I think he'd agree that's the real danger. But unless we we find a way to begin to address the problem, say, of the Midwest, which we've addressed on the podcast on numerous occasions, being totally ignored by the Democratic Party, totally ignored by the mainstream, the middle classes in this country, we're going to continue to see the growth. My greatest fear is not Trump and Trumpism. My greatest fear is that knucklehead in Florida that's going to be the next Trump because he's cleaner. Yeah. He's not going to identify it, with 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 uh, Andy's uh, uh, cults. He's not going to identify with the vulgarity of Trump. He's not going to uh, to to be an abomination. I mean, go around and saying the ugly things he says about women, and yet he's going to be far worse in terms of his policies. I think you're absolutely right, Greg. And I, and I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, we, you spoke a little bit about the sort of Christian nationalism thing to me, and 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 responding to this. I feel like part of the reason it's so hard for Democrats to respond to this is because um, the right has so uh, successfully latched on to pillars of patriotism um, as as sort of uh, you know what they believe in that it's that it's hard to push back against that. For example, Christian nationalism or or the policing issue; these have been uh, uh, sort of manhandled by the right in such a way that that if a democratic leader comes out and says, hey, maybe we should talk about the extremists in law enforcement, or hey, maybe we should talk about 
um, these church leaders who are getting very political and very, very violent uh, uh, across the country, um, it just looks like anti-America uh, um, because of the way that the right has latched on to these pillars, um, even though you know, me as a reporter, I go into communities, you know, and talk to church leaders and, and, and you know, speak to uh, gun rights activists and, 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 and you talk to people and they're like, no, I don't agree with that stuff. But I also don't feel like I need to uh, defend myself because I don't believe any of that radical crap. Meanwhile, all the radical crap is growing. Um, do you see, you know, do you see any route to the, the Democrats responding to these big issues without, you know, wresting control of the, the, the conversation around them. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think we have we have to be careful that we don't get uh, totally absorbed in this quote unquote anti-fascism. We need a, an offensive, an offensive that's that's answering and addressing the questions of people who've been left out. And they're the people that are most succumb the most to these extreme views because they see nobody else offering answers. I mean, I right. grew up in the Midwest. Pat grew up in the Midwest. We know people. We know how desperate people can be. We know how how good they are intrinsically, but how they're fumbling around for answers and they don't see them. Right. So I, I'm, I'm, my advocacy is around, let's find a positive thing that we can counterpose to these right. false answers. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, you, you bring up a really good point. I think I think part of that is um, is the destigmatization of political activism right now, because I think another, um, you know, propaganda style thing that the right has done very well is to lump every single protester left of center into that Antifa category to the degree that people are scared to go out and 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 be political for, for, for you know, because they're going to be labeled personally sometimes by Donald Trump as Antifa, which he calls domestic terrorists, right? And, and I feel like, um, and, and, you know, the, you know, the propaganda campaign that made everyone think that even now cities are on fire across the country from the BLM rallies in 2020. Um, you know, it, it really seems like I totally agree with you that there needs to be a total offensive on the left um, against this stuff, because, you know, we are allowed to be out in the street. We are allowed to be political. We are allowed to be active without being labeled as some kind of violent force. That's the thing. It's like, if if the Proud Boys on the other side were ever rebuffed by the GOP, which they have not been, or if they weren't violent, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. Um, if they were really just a patriotic group of guys who go out there and protest, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But the left has yet to respond. And I think part of that goes with the stigmatization of all political activism on the left right now. Right. You know, 20 years ago, if we were, and we were, um, protesting the the war of the the in 2001 the uh, invasion of Afghanistan and in 2003 Iraq hundreds of thousands of people would be mobilized I've been to demonstrations in DC and New York and other places and here's the black box folks you know here's a hundred thousand people families people with their children and so on and here's this group in black and they start a fire and they break some windows the next day mainstream media doesn't talk about the hundred thousand or the two hundred thousand they talk Absolutely. about the violence and so we kind of live under that. And that's what frightens so many people in the Midwest and other places. And, and it, that's why and it sucks. Portland is a place that's kind of hopeless now because you've you've got war between two groups of mm -hmm. unproductive people, people that are really trying to get attention. Yeah. And 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 you you hit the nail on the head when you say that, you know, those one incidents can change the whole narrative because, you know. I talked to Harvard researchers who looked at every single event during 2020 or thousands of events. 96.6% uh, of those events had zero calls to law enforcement for property destruction and zero calls for uh, uh, violent injuries. So overwhelmingly peaceful. Uh, but, but again, you have Fox News so critically using those small uh, scenes of, of fires of of people holding Molotov cocktails, wearing masks. Um, it is is has been so perfectly utilized to the degree that people really think, oh my God, remember those violent uh, rallies of of 2020? When in reality, that's just not how it went down. Uh, it's it's uh, 
it's it, it's really tough and and i agree with you that you know it only takes a couple of 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 uh bad situations to be put on camera to change the entire narrative yeah i you guys got this you are you are well, i don't know you guys about are well that. schooled in all of this uh i i, this, this I, mayhem. Think, I think adam schiff is as much of the problem and rachel maddow to a certain extent i mean you know i guarantee you the 1776 returns report isn't going to be prominent you're not going to be in looking at the inside of government that supported this um you know and rachel although she really hits she she can do go a good job I, she went a little bit off the rail with the russia gate thing and that that was harmful and i think matt taibbi's done a nice job uh, uh exposing that kind of mendacity associated with that over coverage which doesn't get to the coverage of what greg is talking about which are one of the real underlying issues that are contributing to this the, the networks are also playing catch up and uh, along with everyone else and really you know covering hate and extremism over these you know since the, the the rise of trump i've seen so many congressional hearings on hate and extremism where instead of talking about how to fix the thing that you know most of the room agrees with exists which is hateful violence um, they instead spend the entire hearing debating whether uh, white supremacist violence exists because of one person in that room saying, well, white supremacist violence doesn't, doesn't exist. And so government, media all have to play catch up in terms of, you know, not just recognizing the problem, but responding to it by, by you know, tamping down the misinformation. Think, what do you think Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter is going to, going to do? You think he's going to Oof. open that up to, to uh, all well, kinds you of know, uh, so far, it's it's you know, so far you know it, it, his he has almost exclusively taken advice from uh, people like Andy No um, and, and you know these sort of bad actors on the right um, who are his sycophants, and he's taking advice so far from sycophants rather than from experts or from his own employees, and and he is you know creating so-called amnesty uh, where he's going to bring back all these extremists. Extremists are flooding the platform again um, and, and pushing their rhetoric on there, feeling very comfortable under Elon Musk. So far, it's been really bad. Um, there's been zero moderation. And anyone who was moderating, uh, you know, extremism or child exploitation uh, are gone. They've all been laid off. So it's been really bad. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't know what the answer is right now, but this platform is such a good tool because you can hear about a shooting in Houston and and look it up on Twitter and there'll be somebody posting from inside the place where it's happening. I mean, it is it is such a good, you know, tool for journalism. It's such a good tool for emergency services, uh, you know, across the world. Um, I'm really hoping that something gets fixed here because, um, you know, we're seeing an influx of extremism and we're seeing journalists, researchers, activists uh, being pushed off the platform because of what Elon Musk does. And and he, so far, he's been hypocritical. I mean, he said his number one priority uh, at one point taking over was child exploitation. They just reported yesterday that he had completely decimated the child exploitation team that looks at whether um, explicit material involving children was on Twitter. That team's gone. Uh, how are they going to moderate that? They've, they've got nobody left. Um, and, and so, you know, there's to me the trajectory that we're on is that you know the, the hateful <laughs> conduct that we're seeing and the extremist flooding you know that's not going to stop that seems to be the trajectory we're on well is it going to be the clash of the great uh, monopolies you know you've got uh amazon or uh, apple who might you know take their app off their store which is a huge monopoly and you've got twitter huge monopoly it's a private it's a private company you can do whatever the heck he wants I, yeah, I, you know, I don't see the government uh, he's, uh, stepping yeah, he's in. Gonna, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to come back. I mean, Musk is going to come back with the uh, the matter because of his elevated level. He can say this. You it's know, a matter of free speech. Yeah, and it I is. Think, it, it, you know, it, I don't say it's free speech. It, it, that's what he's going to say. The platforms aren't bound by you know U.S. Constitution, but you're right. That's what they say. Now, what every platform owner realizes when they say, "Hey, free speech," even the ones that are starting gab and other uh, social media platforms that almost 
exclusively cater to Nazis, they start off by saying, oh, I love free speech. Everyone can say whatever they want. And then child porn comes onto their platform. Right. And they go, wait, 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 not that. And then hateful violence and mass shootings come on their platform. And they go, wait, 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 not that. And slowly over time, these owners realize, wait, we do need moderation because we realize when uh, that there are actors all over the world who are really good at causing harm and masking hate and violence as freedom of speech and they will utilize any opportunity that they're given to to sort of uh, sanitize that violence as free speech so uh, i don't know what's gonna happen with twitter i hope that we can all find a platform where there's a lot of people there and there's some moderation going on what's the deal with the sex stuff with the proud boys i mean to a certain extent, there is this underlying feature, as far as I can see, of fear of women, of you know the uh, these these antiquated theories about not masturbating because you're going right. to lose your superpower. I, right. Is this just a? Um, are we underestimating the problem of men in society feeling insignificant, uh, feeling uh, displaced? Right. Feeling powerless. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, we we talked earlier a, about those comedians who in the early aughts diverged paths. Half of them, not, I wouldn't say half, some of them uh, doubled down on the misogynist rhetoric as their main point of comedy. And I think a lot of that was just, we don't want to let go of what we had. And whenever anybody says culturally, I don't want to let go of what we had. I want to go back to the good days. Often what they mean is some sort of, uh, uh, you know, racist, misogynist, or, you know, other uh, ideology that once held people down and benefited white men. And, and so I think, so the Proud Boys second degree, the second rank is attained by doing two things that are very weird, which you touched on. One is that you have to be surrounded by other members of the group and punched repeatedly until you can name five breakfast cereals. It is a ridiculous uh, and funny looking uh, uh, hazing ritual that you can look on, on YouTube. Um, you know, Gavin McGinnis says, this is your first foyer into battle. This is going to teach you to, to be better at fighting. It's going to raise your testosterone. Of course, that's not true. It looks ridiculous. It's embarrassing for everyone involved, um, but it's, presumably creates a fraternal thing between these guys. The second one, uh, the second rule of the second degree is that you cannot masturbate unless you're within several feet of a woman. Now, that is, it's called no wanks. It's uh, ridiculous. It's one of the things that sort of draws people to the Proud Boys uh, sort of like with intrigue because what the hell, you're right. But, but you know, this is rooted in obviously misogyny um and and you know they gavin professes along with a number of other shock jocks like alex jones that not not masturbating is going to raise your testosterone levels now all of this is based on bad science it is based on a uh, 2001 study with a sample size of 10 that found that your testosterone levels went up or something when you're uh, when you didn't masturbate uh plenty of actual legitimate studies have said the opposite is true but but what it is is it's rooted in um it's this misogynist idea these guys are obsessed with the idea that women and especially working women are responsible for the downfall of masculinity and the downfall of men and the femininity of men and and what that is all rooted in is we want to go back to what we had which is complete control over women uh, you know, more money for, for, for white men, more uh, clout and, and uh, uh, influence for white men. And anything that impedes on that is a threat. So yes, uh, you're right. This is, you know, psychologically, we're looking at a bunch of guys who have been convinced that they are uh, under threat from brown people uh, in other countries, from, from women in the workplace, um, and they want to fight back against that. Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's created an entire movement that is, that is totally antiquated and, and uh, just not helpful to society whatsoever.
Yeah, anecdote to rising feminization, and and then you throw in a little being smarky about political correctness, and you that's that's the fuel that's really sparked a lot of this. Yeah, and and, and I'll give you a, just a quick anecdote to show you how effective that is. Uh, there have been a number of of situations where um, you know somebody said that you know immigrants are being dropped off in a certain locale or anti-fascists or you know uh, groups of uh, you know uh, abortion practicing women are going to show up in these locales and their lies created on Facebook but hundreds or thousands of people on the right mobilized to those areas because they think that they're under threat one was in um uh one was in uh, Pennsylvania um in Gettysburg that I went I went to this they somebody said on on Facebook that Antifa was going to come and piss on Confederate graves in Gettysburg and that wasn't true and first of all there's no Confederate gravestones to piss on in Gettysburg so it was hilarious to begin with but hundreds of people showed up there including the KKK and neo-nazis and the only violence that happened that day was a guy who literally shot himself in the foot uh, uh, <laughs> during that but you, you know it all it takes is a little bit of rhetoric these days and the ability to push out that rhetoric to thousands millions of people mobilizes them and it's a you know it's it's a scary time for that have you watched uh, rachel maddow's ultra podcast a little bit yeah um, I, it's uh, wonderful it's yeah, wonderful. absolutely absolutely and it's, just, it's, and it's right it's exactly what you're talking about it's this. yeah and it, you know it, it's refreshing because i think mass media is is really uh you know over the years has had a hard time responding to this and i think that's a great first step that show yeah, it's a good. I waited till all episodes dropped and binged it, but I would highly recommend it. And it's like I said, it's right up, right up your alley. Hey, are these uh, when you go out to these extremist uh, uh, events, and um, is, is it a good place to find a spouse? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what you're hitting on is that uh, at Unite the Right, the the Nazi rally in Charlottesville, it's where I met my wife, uh, who is not a Nazi. Uh, but in a fellow <laughs> extremism reporter, um, and and we met there and and uh, in 2017, and we just got married uh, in August, and uh, yeah, you know, it's a little uh, it's a little extremism family, but we found <laughs> we found love in a hopeless place. So there, oh, there's a great there's a little article, bit of light in the darkness. The great article in news was it in the New York Times? New York Times, you, yeah. you too. That was just that. I just made me feel so good that. Oh, uh, thank you. That you no, guys it's, met it's and found each other. So that's wonderful. So. Absolutely, it's uh, it's it's a little light in the darkness for me. It's 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 a, it's a wonderful thing we have going. Any final thoughts, Greg? No, I just want to thank Andy for, for uh, coming on. It's really been uh, he's, the work is is more than useful. It's essential work that you're doing, and uh, we're happy that you shared your your work with us. Very happy. Hey, coming coming from you guys, that 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 really means so much. I truly appreciate you having me on and having this important conversation. Good. Well, I you know get get the book. I I can't say it. I it's one of those books that I just I binged and I just as I'm reading it, I all I could say is I want to talk to this guy. I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> you and guys rock for reaching out. And and this is this is a, that's what's so fun about doing this. So, Andy, thank you so much. Uh, we'll thank you guys. Uh, We'll we'll put this in the can and uh, hopefully people will enjoy it as much as we have. Yeah, and after this sedition trial, I mean, we're about to set the tone here at their sedition trial for how the Justice Department responds to extremism. So have me back on. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Good. Let's do it. Good. Yeah. Look Good. forward to it. Thank you so much. All right.